Okay, hey, uh, happy, uh, happy, what is it, March, and uh, welcome back, um, recording from my bedroom studio here. Um, so what I'm going to talk today about is, is really manufacturing, and it's really a, a very central topic. And uh, before I do that, we'll go through standards a little bit more and where things are at and where they're going and show how this fits. And I, I, I think it does probably more future standards than it does today, and we'll, we'll hit, hit that in a little bit. So uh, that's where we're at. Uh, last time we were at, I gave, I think, the hardest quantitative problem I've given so far. And I asked the question that, uh, let's do an experiment where what you do is you have a styrofoam cup of water and you've got 100 milliliters of water in it, which is equal to 100 grams of water in there. And uh, so there's your water. What I'm going to do is take a block of something, either aluminum or lead, take 100 grams of it, and I'm going to take that to 100 degrees C, and then I'm going to put that in there. And what's going to happen is heat's going to transfer out of the metal into the, li the liquid, and uh, basically Q out of the metal is going to be equal to the, the Q in to the liquid, or maybe I'm going to use W water for, for that. So that's basically the heat transfer out of one and in. And, and one of the big themes, physical science, is energy, heat, is conserved somehow. And uh, so that's a good way to do that. So basically you start off, initially, this water is at 25 degrees C. This is at 100 degrees C. And then when it's all said and done, they all come to some equilibrium temperature after afterwards so the water is going to heat up that the and the the metal will cool down and they'll both end up at the same temperature so mathematically the way we can the way we can state that is that the change in temperature of the water is going to be equal uh, I'm sorry plus change in temperature of the metal is going to be equal to 75 degrees C. They're 75 degrees C apart. So what I can say is the change in the temperature of the metal is equal to 75 minus change in temperature of the water. So the water is going to cool down, the metal is going to heat up, and uh, that's, what's, that's what's going to happen. So I can, this equation can be used. So I'm going to use superscripts um, just to, to, to keep metal versus water. And then I can expand this equation to say that um, Q in for the water, or Q out for the water, is going to be equal to delta T for the water times the heat capacity of the water times the mass of the water is equal to the change in temperature of the metal heat capacity of the metal, mass of the metal. And both the masses are equal to 100 grams, so actually you can divide these out. Those divide off on both sides. Those go away. And what's really interesting is the heat capacity of water, by definition, is 1 calorie per gram per degree C, per degrees K. And um, if you look at aluminum, it's about a fifth of that. If you look at lead on a per gram basis, it's about 3% of that. So you can run that through and basically just make the substitutions into the equation. So this is um, delta T sub M. This term ends up here. And what you end up with is the following is delta T sub water times Cp water, which is equal to 1, is equal to... Um, 75 times uh, 75 da, da, da. this thing 75 minus delta T W C P M that thing and then all it is just an algebra problem from that from that point on what you find then is for uh, the aluminum Delta T water is equal to about 
13 degrees, not very much for the lead. Since it has a, so much a smaller heat capacity, it's delta T W is only about two degrees, much much smaller amount. Um, so that, that is actually a fairly um, lengthy problem, I think, for the ninth grade. But it does show, you know, algebra. It's a little bit of a you know semi advanced algebra. It's a real problem, and it's one that you could very very easily do in your classroom very nicely. Um, again showing the power of math and if anybody has further questions uh, put them up on the on the board we'd be uh, happy to be happy to talk through them and uh, should have left myself a little more room to, to deal with that so anyway that that's from last time so let's go on to new material um, what I want to do is, is again kind of connect everything back to standards and um, where we're at right now this is what's going on this year in, um, in in physical science and the places that we really tend to do a lot of material science kind of nature of science and engineering do a little bit with motion and force um, you know classification of matter we we hit big chemical bonds and reactions we hit significantly and uh, inter interactions of matter we can do a, a fair bit with well I think everybody is aware that changes are afoot in the way science is being taught and you know since I'm not a high school science teacher I, I know about this kind of in the abstract much more than um, that, than I think you guys and I think it's a whole lot of people who might listen to this that are a whole lot more expert on this than me but let me give you my my take and show where things fit well first of all um, you know we're working on a new um, new curriculum for Columbus City for 2014 for ninth grade physical science. This is a working draft for that. It's it's really fairly similar. A lot of the same things will fit. Atoms, classifications of matter, periodic table. These are core things where material science can be used. We've done some nice labs on electricity that fits. Reaction of matters fits. Bonding and compounds. So, so material science can be very strong up through here. Again. Um, Forces work great with springs. We can hit this with springs, and then there's a lot we can do. Thermal energy, for example, what we just what we just talked about. So that's what's going to happen in um, Columbus City next year. And this is absolutely a draft, but we are trying to make material science be sort of a unifying unifying thread that would run through much of this. And uh, you'll see how that goes. I think one example might be using, for example. Uh, uh, malachite to copper to make copper and then take and process that copper into something useful. Well the other thing that's happening is we're going towards next generation science standards and this is a national a national thing and uh, this is based on, on three things and, and I think it's still unfolding so far as I can tell exactly what's going to be taught in what grade and it looks like there'll be a lot of discretion as to what goes where um, in, in for example high school you know you're supposed to come out of eighth grade at a certain level and then what happens in high school happens over that period uh, physical science will likely still sit in, um, in ninth grade but this is um, what things look like and there's three three things there, there, there's there's practices and by the way this comes from an article um, in, in science teacher there's practices there's core disciplinary ideas in the physical sciences and then there are cross-cutting concepts and I think material science can actually play a really really strong role in all of this um, for example everything we're doing is very hands-on so planning and carrying out investigations is a big deal analyzing and interpreting data we can do quite a job with uh, something that I've been really hitting hard is mathematics and computational thinking um, and I think that absolutely belongs with science math is the language of science um, and, and an amazingly uh, predictive one. Um, the other thing that's in there is, is uh, constructing explanations for science and designing solutions in engineering. And this is something that we're going to hit hard today is designing solutions um, and making stuff as part of that. And then uh, when we look at the core disciplinary ideas, really chemical reactions are one that we, we end up hitting hard. Forces in motion, we can do a fair bit with springs and so forth. Stability and instability, even melting and what phases are present is really a statement of stability. Uh, conservation of energy and energy transfer, 
we will deal a fair bit with energies and forces. Um, chemical processes in everyday life, and I consider everyday life to con consider ma uh, to include manufacturing. And this one we're going to uh, see in a, a big sense in a little bit. And then when we get to cross-cutting uh, concepts. I think patterns is, is sort of one. You know, look at crystals; they're they're very patterned. It's a little different way than they're talking about pattern here. One that's really important is scale, proportion, and quantity. When we talk about microstructure back earlier in this course. That's one that that fits in really well. Um, structure and function is 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 huge. Um, again, we microstructure is what it is. We make objects into shapes uh, for for particular reasons. And then stability and change. Microstructure: what happens when we anneal something and so forth. This also uh, is really important. Also, that couples in with with energy and energy flows and so forth. So material science really fits all over this the whole approach that we're talking about that's been developed through the ASM Education Foundation I think um, has a lot to do with all of this. So anyway the the stuff that's going to be in, in today's lecture I think actually fits these next generation science standards better than it does um, some of the current stuff but it, it doesn't do really a bad job on the current stuff either. So what are we going to do today? Well, today what we're going to do is um, do this on manufacturing and making stuff. Um, all around us, the stuff that we use is designed and manufactured. And manufacturing is a big cross-cutting word. It has a lot to do with a lot of things, including energy, the economy, jobs, all of that. What it really is, is manufacturing in its end is a way of not wasting money, or I say cheaply, producing a controlled chemistry, shape, and microstructure. That's really what we're doing. Um, the processes that go into making almost anything, a beverage can, a light bulb, um, a pencil, uh, automobile, a tire on an automobile, the spring in the seat in your car, the, the talents that it takes to make something lowly, like the spring in the seat in your car, and get the coatings on it, and the design and everything, it, it's really awesome. And there's a lot of jobs tied up in that, and there's a lot of technology, and um, you know, doing it economically is really important. Huge number of people are involved in this thing, which is really a technical activity, it requires many skills, and I think materials are an absolute key to the process. And um, this activity is really connected to the, our economy and the rest of, of our way of life, and that's why I want to hit manufacturing here and again I think it hits really cleanly into a lot of the, the upcoming next generation science standards and, and it, it hits today as well but but really really it resonates with what's coming so just to show um, kind of uh, this is a real big picture plot and this is one I could spend a whole lecture on Actually, this whole lecture here I could could roll into a whole course um, but energy sustainability, this comes from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. What they ask is, where does energy come from? And things come from solar a little bit, uh, nuclear a little bit, hydro a little bit, wind. Natural gas is big, coal is big, petroleum is huge, biomass is significant. Um, and then where does this energy end up going? Well, a lot of this energy, you know, like natural gas and coal and so forth, end up going into, into electricity generation, for example. Some, like petroleum, coal is used directly. And then where does it go? Well, you know, energy is one of these things that's conserved. This is a core idea in physical science. And of that energy, a lot of it is lost straight off, about half of it. And um, a lot of it goes to do its job. And then there are three basic places it goes. About a third goes to heat and light our homes, be they residences or commercial buildings. About a third, roughly, goes into transportation. And about a third actually goes into making stuff, into making aluminum, running, running the plants that it takes to make our cars. So this is about one-third uh, buildings, one-third, you know, processes, 
things like making fiberglass, making cement, cement, and, and we could actually break this down tremendously. Cement is, is one that's huge. Pulp and paper is huge. Metalworking and metal refining uh, in particular is huge. And then transportation, we all know about. This is what, uh, you know, what we talk about when we talk about fuel economy and so forth. This is about a third. And these are all huge, 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 huge numbers that all kind of go into this, into this plot. Well, today what we're going to talk about really is, 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 is this part. Next week we're going to talk some about this part. We're going to talk about these processes that consume about a third of the energy we use as a country. And that's based on making stuff of various sorts. I think I've got some other things to flip on there. So, you know, one thing we could do is if we're smart with materials, we can reduce vehicle weight. That'll save on transportation. And um, if we have more efficient processes, that will help us save on these industrial processes. So these are, um, this is sort of a promo slide for stuff that I do at Ohio State. Then we work sometimes on processes that, that can help reduce vehicle weight. So we are sometimes trying to help with this big, big, big picture here. And doing our very very small part. The other place that manufacturing is a big deal is economic sustainability. If you actually look at where dollars come from and where they go, uh, our biggest export of dollars is for for importing products from China and the Far East. And uh, if you look at this, uh, this is billions of dollars that exit the country per quarter, and we maxed out in 2008 about two hundred dollars two hundred billion dollars going out and the biggest part of that was actually uh, for manufactured goods that are coming in from other places oil is, is a big part of that uh, paying people uh, outside the country to, to be for example in military service is a big part but um, uh, manufacturing is a big big part of this and if we can locally manufacture we can capture that money and that's, I'm sure, the way the part, the way things are going, and you know, smaller volumes, more flexible plants are required. That's all kind of backgroundy information. So anyway, th this is where manufacturing is going, and um, you know, in the old oldish days, still to now, this is what manufacturing looks like. We need tools and dies, which are uh, expensive to make. They go into these big presses, and there's factories that look like this all over the place. Um, and then you can squeeze metal into that, squeeze plastic into it, or there are new techniques coming up. Um, this is a MakerBot, one of the coolest things I think that come along in the last decade. These things are just getting, getting better, faster, cheaper. And what you can do in this case is take thermoplastics, melt them, and squirt them out where you need them, and uh, make parts directly that way. And uh, uh, you can't can't make things quite as cheaply per part, but you can make them right where they're needed with very little waste, all local. Um, there's some cool things happening in this space that uh, can be truly revolutionary. So uh, that's something to work, look, look at. So anyway, just setting the stage that manufacturing is important. So I'm going to give again kind of a brief overview of all kinds of stuff that I think could be done in a ninth grade grade physical science classroom and what we're going to talk about is really talking about making the stuff that we need every day we'll talk about metals talk about ceramics and glasses kind of together talk about polymers and the big two big classes of polymers are thermoplastics and thermosets these are things like thermoplastics are things like wax and polyethylene And the thing about wax and polyethylene is what you can do is you can take them and melt them, resolidify them over and over and over again, and uh, they really, um, to, a, to a good extent, they don't they don't care. You can make keep making things. Thermosets are things like epoxy, which you may have bought from the hardware store. You mix up the two parts, the two resins react, crosslink, form this hard plastic. If you take that plastic and heat it up again, it will not melt. Heat it enough, it'll just burn. Um, things I won't talk about. I won't talk about composites. We could do a whole lecture on tools course on manufacturing composites. We're not going to talk about electronic and functional materials, which we could also talk about for a long time. There's a lot more uh, in, in, in this case in particular. But there's some really, really cool, interesting stuff because we are making these circuits um, where on the head of a pin you might have thousands if not hundreds of thousands of transistors and this is all technology that's basically been developed over the course of my lifetime I'm a little over 50 but it's uh, you know 
radically radically interesting stuff that has um, truly changed the world in my uh, in my lifetime. So um, and again, making the point, these geeky people that that work work on these processes do change the world, and uh, your students can be part of that next bit. So let's go through metals. Um, and again, this is going to be done on a survey type approach. Where do they come from? Basically rocks, ores. How do we make stuff? Well, there's three basic things we can do. We can cast something, basically heat the metal up, let it solidify. We've talked about this already. This works nicely with phase diagrams. We can take material and work it. Um, not talking about uh, modeling sort of stuff, uh, but uh, meaning shaping it plastically, rolling, drawing, stamping, coining, a whole bunch of processes. And then you could machine it. And I'm not going to say anything more about machining except to say, yeah, you can do that, which machining is basically, you know, cutting, taking a big block, big block of something, and then using tools to cut out whatever you need inside of it and, and, and rescue that part. Uh, machining, we do all the time, a good way, very good way to get highly precise parts, but it's a fairly wasteful process because we're taking metal and turning it into chips. If you can you do something directly by casting or by forming it plastically, these are much more efficient processes in the end. They actually end up costing a lot less energy to make what we need. So again, this is something we talked about before, and I think this is a great lab I'd love to see developed. It's starting from malachite, and, and we're doing this in our lab now. Make copper and we can do this from malachite we can make virgin metal from common ores as well um, and uh, that we're working on right now and out of this we can get a crucible and in that crucible we can get little bits of copper in the bottom take that copper and I think we can take that and prove that we can fashion that into things like wires measure the strength conductivity and so forth of that wire and I think that could make an outstanding series where we can show the chemistry that's into this, show the properties of the wire, put numbers against this, um, and that's something that we're that I'd like to see us go towards. So again, um, the the thing that I'll focus on here mostly is working stuff, and when you're working stuff, and you talk about something like wrought iron, wrought is a tenth that we typically don't use much anymore, but it's the past tense of work. So wrought iron is work, worked iron. So we have work hardening happens during this, and if we make a stress-strain curve, remember this is something that we could do with aluminum wires or, or other wires, just on their own by hanging stuff from it. We've done this in this series of lectures. We can plot stress versus strain. And most materials work harden, meaning that the stress, which is equal to force over area, increases. So as you're taking this thing and pulling on it, volume is conserved. So as you're pulling this way, the cross section is decreasing. But still at the same time, the wire is getting stronger because you're doing something to the structure. And so the strength ends up increasing, and particularly the stress, flow stress keeps up, keeps increasing. We can quantify this by making a percentage cold work, and this is we we can take the area and we usually do this based on the areas. You stretch it, the volume is conserved, so the area decreases. So we can have a original area, deformed area, and by comparing those, we can get a per percent cold work. Point is at this stage that we can quantify how much work we're putting into something and how much of an increase in strength. Therefore, we can expect. So there's a bunch of ways of doing this. Stretching things directly is the most uncommon way of doing it. The really common ways of doing this are processes like forging, which is taking a piece of metal, squeezing it into a die with a force like this to make a shape that we're interested in. Rolling is another one that's very common. Just basically have two rolls, take a thick piece of metal, make thin metal out of it. That's the way we might like make something like aluminum, for example. Drawing. I think you've seen in the ASM class. Uh, we can take wire, bring it through draw plates that have progressively smaller openings, make finer and finer wire this way. 
or we can do extrusion, which is similar, except we can make, make much bigger reductions in one shot. We can also make some very interesting shapes all in one shot by, by doing something that isn't round at the end. And again, you're reducing the area. In all cases, when you plastically deform the metal like this, you're putting a whole bunch of defects called dislocations into the metal, and those dislocations are largely what give metal strength. A few dislocations are required to make metal deform. If you have lots of them, they get in the way of one another and uh, give, the metal, give the metal strength. And this is what dislocations look like. This is a titanium alloy after cold rolling. And these dislocations, again, I could spend a long time lecturing on them. I've got colleagues that have written entire books on dislocations. Basically, they're defects that allow deformation to take place. They can tangle with each other. Um, more of them are generated as you cold work, and that what, that's what makes the material stronger as you cold work, that the dislocations get in the way of one another. The material gets stronger and stronger as you work it. And so this is uh, an example with some steels. This is with no cold working, with 4% cold work, with 24% cold work. You can see that the initial, the initial strength, this is strength in megapascals, me megapascals are millions, of newtons per square meter. It's a megapascal. You can see this is fairly low strength. Deforms at about 250 megapascals at first. Put in 4% cold work. You're getting up here where about 300 megapascals is required. Put in 24%. You up here to where you know about 600% 600, 600 megapascals are required to get the material to start flowing. So again, this is the same stress strain diagram that we produced for wires earlier in the course. And then the other thing that you can do with metals is, is you can put heat into them after you've deformed them and then what happens you can get a process called recrystallization where these where these these grains are unstable that have all these dislocations in them and you'll form brand spanking new very perfect grains and these are initially small they consume the slow, cold work crystal because the new ones have a smaller, lower energy. So new crystals nucleate after just three seconds at 580 degrees C, and this is for a brass, I believe. Yep, 33% cold work brass. And give it a little more time. After four seconds, you're seeing bigger uh, crystals. After eight seconds, a lot of them, and that's at a reasonably high temperature. But again, what it's showing is with the same composition just by adding some temperature to it, we can cause the structure to change. That change in structure changes the strength pretty significantly. And uh, that's the core idea that I think you could do in, in ninth grade. So there's a whole bunch of things you can do with metals. Um, again, the ASM group of material exercises has a lot of things in it. We've talked about casting earlier. Working through rolling, we can provide rolling mills, draw plates, and so forth. Uh, you can do that. Phase transformations fit into this nicely. Um, you can take something and, and work it, then anneal it to show you can bring the strength down again. Uh, we've shown we can make tensile tests. We can do toughness tests, basically a toughness test. Um, a real easy way to do this. Is you can instrument something with something called a Sharpie impact test, where we basically take a little bar, looks like this, put a little notch in it, and then what we do is have a hammer that comes through, and the hammer is on a pendulum like this, it comes through. We can thwack this thing and then see how high the pendulum comes back on the other side. And that loss in height is basically how much energy was absorbed in breaking the bar. And that is another thing that could be very easily implemented. Very nice destructive demo you could do in a ninth grade classroom. Uh, with steels, we can make martensite. We can do nails. We can temper them or harden them. Some great stuff. These are also on the ASM thing. And then we also, the one I really like that I want to develop is you know, making wires from scratch, then developing in, them into, uh, developing, making copper from scratch, making that into wires, making them into springs. And you could really feel some ownership, a lot like what was done in a toaster project um, book and videos and so forth. Okay, that's metals again. Very fast, um, over, very fast overview. We'll do the same thing with polymers and ceramics. Do some very fast overviews. 
Polymers are very different than metals and ceramics. I asked the question, how are they different? First of all, the, the structures are very, um, very disordered. Entropy tends to drive the structures. They're primarily amorphous. Entropy um, also is responsible for the uh, elasticity in elastomers. I'll talk a little bit about the full phenomenon is beyond, I think, what you could do in ninth grade, but there's some very cool stuff related to that. Uh, mechanical behavior in polymers is strongly related to temperature. And then probably the most important part of polymers, <laughs> why they're so dominant, is it's really easy to form them, particularly thermoplastics, by injection molding them. Therefore, they are cheap. So if you go into Target, you'll find all kinds of plastic was injection molded in China. Happy Meal toys, which I think are kind of on the outs. Um, you know, our house was full of when we had small kids, um, you know, injection molded, easy to make very cheap and that's one of the great great things about polymers so what what they look like is again this is great chemistry um, it's carbon carbon bonding and um, the suggestion was made in class that you know a lot of a lot of uh, biological structures our polymers look a lot like this this carbon carbon bond is a really really strong one so in the case of polyethylene it's just basically this chain of carbons all the bonds are saturated by hydrogens on either side, you know, carbons on two sides, hydrogens on the other, and you can make these very, very long bonds with literally thousands or hundreds of thousands of units on these zigzag structures. This is polyethylene, polyvinyl chloride. We just have the occasional chloride ion kicking about in there. Polypropylene got the CH3 three groups hanging out occasionally and uh, these are all thermoplastics and these things have a weak hydrogen bonding that makes one chain bond to the other and these very very strong covalent bonds act along the chains and so what happens is when you heat them up to where they act liquidy what you've done is basically melted the secondary bonds between chains but the covalent bonding along the chain backbone remains very solid so when you cool it back down again everything goes back you get the hydrogen bonds the whole thing just comes right back um, as it was and if you can align these very much so that you have all the, the uh, strong covalent bonds going the same direction you make very very fine very very strong fibers and there's a fiber called uh, dyneema which is basically polyethylene where everything is very very highly aligned to that direction you give it get remarkable properties out of this not as cheap as a milk jug which is also polyethylene uh, but but a less expensive process there so chain configurations you can have linear you can have branch chains cross-linked and as, you, as things cross-link these secondary bonds now go, now go chain to chain and this is what makes basically thermosets and so if you heat these things up they might soften a little bit but they will not melt you can't reshape a thermoset polymer or something once it's cross-linked networks are similar so these are also thermosets so you can't process them quite the same way once you once you've made the the the, the polymer it's it's done can't can't do no more So here's uh, molecular weight and crystallinity. This is another thing that changes the uh, the, the, the properties of the plastic. Um, you can have short molecular weights, long molecular weights. Milk jugs have fairly high molecular weights. Chemically very similar to a milk jug, which is polyethylene, is wax. Wax basically just has a smaller molecular weight. You've got shorter chains associated with it. Long chains to me, harder to untangle, harder to uh, slide. As a result, you get stronger stuff, you have more crystallinity. Things also tend to get uh, harder. And we won't deal too much about the crystallinity, but the polymers have some very interesting structures. You can have very regular regions within them. Again, stuff I won't talk too much about here. Um, a big thing that's common with polymers and glasses is that if you really crystallize something, imagine we're liquid, we have a specific volume, this is inverse of density, and you have a melting point. 
if we have something like aluminum we hit the melting point you're, you're cooling down from high temperature you hit the melting point here you go whomp down and your volume changes instantaneously as you go from liquid to solid at the melting temperature that happens fairly instantly um, at that temperature as a first order phase transformation the other thing that can happen is if you've got um, something like glass you're cooling down you hit the melting point it may not be able to solidify for, for reasons that the, the chains get in their own way and they can't form that that solid structure which is usually crystalline so as a result of that you cool down the viscosity increases and eventually eventually it kind of squeezes out what's called the free volume and your parent thermal expansion coefficient changes and you hit what's called a glass transition and the material becomes fairly glassy at that point so polymers and glasses are things that have hard times solidifying they you hit the melting temperature but they may not be able to solidify so they have this amorphous disordered structure that gets locked in and can become glassy you get below the glass transition temperature and things can be um, can get below the glass transition temperature and things get very hard so polyethylene has very low glass transition temperature so at room temperature it's still pretty pliable some of these other materials like polycarbonate has a high glass transition temperature so at room temperature it's pretty darn stiff for example so that's how we end up you know varying the properties of, of polymers with, with temperature and we can control that and if you plot generally temperature versus molecular weight we can get a whole bunch of different kinds of behavior that come out of that that's part of why we like plastic so much we can go all the way from things that are very hard and structural uh, to things that are pliable like pleather uh, the the plastic leather that was uh, in vogue when I was growing up um, and you know, fortunately we've kind of grown out of pleather but uh, we still uh, still sometimes like to, to modify properties in that way so uh, again the, the classification of polymers how do they how does feed it, heating affect structure well you have thermoplastics these are generally ductile not cross-linked they soften with heat they're usually pretty recyclable these are some examples these are the um, recycling codes thermosets are not very easy to recycle they're usually more hard more brittle they're cross-linked they don't soften so much with heating um, they do soften some and then these are some examples of thermosetting plastics big things we we need different processes to make these things and you know the, the uh, automotive components are often thermosets but thermoplastics are coming on with uh, uh, thermoplastics are coming on with composites as well I'm gonna stop I'm not gonna talk too much about drawing except to say we can line up these covalent bonds along a drawing direction a stretching direction that can give you improved properties um, there's a lot of other ways we can fabricate uh, plastics that we'll get to in another slide or two um, before I, I do that I'll talk a little bit about elastomers elastomers basically you have some cross links and a lot of slippage below between chains you have these things above their glass transition temperature as a result of that you can make rubber bands which are very stretchy you can get huge amounts of strain very very low moduli associated with them and uh, it's because of this chain structure and getting a lot of mobility between chains that, that makes that happen and again we could spend a lot of time on that this is what I did want to get to is kind of forming techniques there's a lot you can do if you have um, if you have thermoplastics you can injection mold or extrude basically just squeeze stuff into a mold squeeze stuff on an extruder to make uh, uh, things like um, uh, films and so forth or, or, or fiber uh, here you can make anything you like happy meal toys and the like you can also do compression molding um, and all of these techniques basically you can do with thermoplastics or thermosets if you're doing a thermoset you've got to be a little more careful with the reaction kinetics make sure it reacts after it's out of the die um, the way we make all kinds of jugs and all that is by blow molding you injection mold with a process like this a parison then you take that parison heat it up blow some air into it and these materials um, the, by the viscous nature they have you can inflate them and make some cool shapes this way that's part of why we love plastic so much there's great ways to make shapes with them very easily and of course that's a split mold that makes all that happen so again lots of experiments we can do with polymers um, shrinky dinks I love the shrinky dink experiment I think it's hard to 
explain the underlying physics at the ninth grade level, but it has to do with, with entropy, um, drawing things back. Elastomer elasticity, we can do some things with when you stretch a rubber band, it becomes cold. We can describe that by, thermo, uh, by thermodynamics. Again, I think beyond ninth grade, but we can think about glass transitions. We can take things and cool them down below their glass transition temperatures, see if they get very brittle and so forth. We can see solidification behavior of, of wax versus water. Uh, water, you have, it's absolutely clear what's ice, what's water. If you're dealing with something like wax, it's it's not so clear. There's not this this this, this uh, clear phase boundary between it as you go through these uh, glass transitions and uh, um, and so forth. We can do a lot with manufacturing and processes. We can we can make things out of uh, make thermosets themselves. For example, nylon or epoxy. We can foam plastics. We can form thermoplastics. Um, there's a lot of great stuff where you can do hydrophilic versus hydrophobic. Um, diaper materials, fake snow, all these things. And then um, the example I started with, the MakerBot, is basically a way of putting thermoplastic down in a shape that you're interested in. There's a lot in the ASM group. Um, I don't think everything fits directly into ninth grade, but, but loads and loads do, and there's lots of good stuff to be done, and I look forward to discussion on what, what one might do. So I'm going to go through the polymer summary uh, Basically, not at all right now. I'll let you read that on your own if you're interested. Move on to ceramics and glasses. Um, ceramics and glasses is the last topic we'll deal with here. They're different than metals, and they have a generally fairly ionic crystal structure. It depends on charge balance. Um, there's a lot of detailed chemistry that that gives the properties. Um, there's few dislocations. Dislocations can't move, therefore they're brittle. They're very uh, creep resistant, but uh, you know, brittle means they don't absorb much energy if you drop them, but at high temperature they're pretty good. And we'll talk a little bit about how these are good for and how you can make ceramics and glasses. Basically, I think I've gone through this before. A ceramic is a compound. Basically, it's a combination of a metal or non-metallic elemental solid and another non-metal or non-metallic elemental solid. Classic examples are things like silicon carbide, alumina, Sodium chloride are, are good typical typical ceramics. Um, important point, we talked about phase diagrams earlier. Ceramics use phase diagrams too. Exactly the same thing, all the same phenomenology I taught you about phase diagrams or, or lectured about, I should say, with phase diagrams. You can do with, um, uh, with, with ceramics. Works just great. Very predictive. Same phenomenology works. And then this is the difference between crystalline ceramics and, and glasses. So silica, SiO2, if it exists in a, in, a, in a ordered form, we call that quartz, it might look like this. But what we can do is add modifiers to it, impurities like this. This makes it difficult to form that crystalline structure. And what we end up with is glass that looks like this. Glass, sometimes we can poison it also. Things like uh, just oils from your hand will poison glass so it will crystallize like this. And sometimes you'll see quartz lamps that people put in with their grubby, oily hands. You'll see frosted areas on them. That's where it's become crystallized. Those frosted areas have a different coefficient of thermal expansion. They don't conduct light very well. They scatter light. And once you see that starting to form, it's not long before the uh, before that thing's going to break because of differential thermal expansion. But anyway, you can have crystalline or glassy ceramics is the point. We can control that through good material science. Same picture I showed you earlier. If you have a glass, it hits a melting temperature, goes beyond that without really a, a discontinuous change in volume, gets to a glass transition temperature. There is a change in slope there as you run out of free volume. When you get down below here, things tend to be tend to be brittle. And either one could happen as you cool something like silica, SiO2, for example. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to have to pull that slide out. But I did want to hit this. This is this is these are some of the great demos you can do with glasses. There's some wonderful demos you can do with glass. Um, one of the best ones, well, it, it, one of the best ones is called the Prince Rupert drop, and it, it goes on this on this approach, which I will explain. So Prince Rupert drop, what you can do is take a uh, glass rod, 
heat the end of it with a propane torch, good propane torch, put a flame on the end of this thing and get it to drop like a gob like this, hopefully make it look like a tadpole into a bucket of water and what happens is initially everything is hot this thing drops into the water the surfaces become very cool so the hot the, the, the surfaces become cool they contract get very hard but the inside is still warm and gooey and then the inside eventually cools down becomes hard and it shrinks later leaving the middle in tension the outside in compression and this is actually a really really good state to be in because it's hard for a crack to start on the surface so you could take that Prince Rupert drop and bang on the outside of it as hard as you want you will not break it uh, but if you take this little t tail end and snap it off basically it will shatter into a thousand pieces and um, because of the stored elastic energy that's in there so the good news is this is a great way to suppress crack growth we can either do this by this this thermal tempering or we can we can change the chemistry on the surface of the glass versus the interior to give these uh, to, to give these these different stress states so um, demos you can do with this there's a bunch of these things and I'll let leave you on your own but but Prince Rupert drops tempered glass what you can do is, is uh, tempered glass is common I think you've seen this in material science camp uh, very very uh, fracture resistant unless you unless you tap it on the edge in which case it really goes in a hurry um, laminated glass there's some great things you can do Corning Museum of Glass has some wonderful demos and then uh, Todd Bolenbaugh's um, YouTube site also has some great demos this is great great stuff that you can do along along these lines really compelling stuff and and, and they are um, you know, not to make a glass pun very transparent exercises in most cases if you understand the idea of stress and how it works this is good this is good stuff um, there's some more decent YouTubes I think a lot of those are the same same topics and then you know there's, there's fabrication methods for all of this stuff so again much like we did with uh, making polymers this is a way we can make bottles and glasses and so forth we can pr press a gob to make something called a parison that parison gets suspended you put gas in there and you blow up that like that we can do fiber drawing this is something that again could be done in your classroom if you have moderate skills with a propane torch you can do some incredible things in terms of, of uh, drawing glass um, Ohio is really I think the materials capital of the United States uh, Owens Corning has great things for gl glass fiber drawing they've also done some neat things in sheet forming um, getting in molten glass basically pick it up on a cooled roll and turn that into glass temper it so forth uh, great practical stuff if you want to do ceramics this is where you could do some great uh, interchange with people in the art department slip casting is where you can take these ceramic particles make a shape out of them basically you make a green shape then you fire it on centering take something that, that's uh, been dried out and you end up getting turning that into a, a, a smaller more dense but much harder structure after you fire it and you get very complicated systems after firing um, a lot of ceramics are also pressed if you want higher density you bake, make powders press them together start like this and then you center them centering or firing is where you basically take these particles which are just basically tacked together on heat they try to reduce their surface energy and they form structures like that it looks like that so you go from centering to make very dense parts in the end so in summary ceramics also very cool and there's some cool fabrication techniques that go with it and some very cool demos that you can do I won't go through that anymore so so anyway he, here's a possible activity I think would be great at the ninth grade level that actually could be done at the end of the year that um, uh, uh, pulls some things together um, so and, and this illustrates really the design process which is one of these parts of the uh, next generation science standards it's a big deal so what you can do is choose an interesting component 
use the internet, figure out how it's made. And if you do anything uh, very careful, if you do have good internet access, there's usually all kinds of cool things on, on how it's made and so forth. And there's a lot of uh, what you could peel the onion way back on this and, and figure out where materials are sourced, how they work. There's chemistry beyond all of this. So trace back how it's made. How far back can you go? Could you go from you know, looking at a tire to tire cord to figuring out where the iron comes from? how the iron turned into steel and so forth and the steel belted radials you can do that for the rubber component all kinds of stuff then how then the next thing you do is how you know if you wanted something that's even better what would you have to do to make that thing better lighter stronger how would you do that would it take a more material more expensive material or process lots of things you could do including beverage containers contact lenses auto tires fake skin paper concrete gypsum drywall all kinds of things and this reverse engineering you know, is really reverse engineering the design process this can tie back to chemistry process I think show all the careers that are involved the energies that are associated with it and then uh, it's actually a pretty nice book I've got a copy called making it it's just about three pages or so on, on um, about uh, probably 80 different processes a lot of obscure obscure ones included Making it manufacturing techniques for product design by a guy named Lefteri, and um, there's others like that. And again, uh, websites like um, how it's made are, are fantastic in that as well. And I think that could be a very rich, interesting activity for a lot of kids. So again, this is where we started this lecturing, um, this lecture. All the physical we use is manufactured. It's a way of controlling shape, chemistry, microstructure all at once. Um, loads of skills are involved with that. Understanding materials is a key. This ties together all kinds of things in life and I think he has, has room in the ninth grade. Hope we can find it together and we'll talk curriculum uh, when, when I see you next, I'm sure. That's it for now. Have a good week and um, uh, look forward to seeing you all soon. Keep that.